قل انني هداني ربي الى صراط مستقيم دينا قيما مله ابراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of our values and today we are going to talk about one of the most prominent values in our religion it is the value of fairness and justice and al-adl which is the arabic word for fairness and justice is one of allah's beautiful attributes and the prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam who would be fair and just if allah and his messenger are not the definition of fairness and justice is best understood by the opposite. So, fairness and justice is the opposite of oppression, of injustice, being unfair. And usually, people define justice to be what you feel is right and straight and it goes without saying when we look around us in the world and we see the huge amount of injustice being practiced by a lot of the people it goes without saying that justice is something that is relative what you see to be justice is not justice in my eyes, and the opposite is true. For example, look at Palestine. When you see the non-Muslims collaborating with the Jews in oppressing, in killing, in making the Palestinians suffer, beyond walls of prisons. Though the land is theirs, though they are the owners of their property and houses, yet you find the whole world is against them. This is not logical. And it comes from people with intellect, who are supposed to be civilized, but there is no logic in what they're doing, and definitely there is injustice in huge amount. But when you ask them, they explain themselves to be fair and just. Therefore, as humans, as Muslims, we believe that Allah Azza wa Jal would not leave humanity to go astray without giving them the measurements of justice and how to identify what is just from what is not. And this is why we have the Quran. The Prophet والسلام, praised the people of fairness and justice by saying, the just will be with Allah on thrones of light on the right hand of the most merciful and both his hands are right. Those who are, then the Prophet elaborates, who, who are those who are just? He said, those who are just in their rulings and are fair with their families and those of whom they are in charge of. And justice is not something that you may choose or you may leave. It's not something that makes you a good human being or not. It is a religious obligation. And again, our values are not stemmed from our nature. 
our heritage, our traditions and customs. It comes directly from our conviction and belief. If you do it, you end up in Jannah. If you don't, you end up in hell. Allah ordered us by saying, O oh, you who believe, be persistently standing firm in justice. Witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves, your parents, or your relatives. Now this is a beautiful command from Allah Azza wa Jal. So beautiful that one of the most prestigious universities in the world, Harvard University, in the school of law, in front of the main entrance, they quoted this ayah from the Quran on their wall, where they put the best coats worldwide promoting justice. We do not need that to know that this is one of the greatest commands of Allah Azza wa Jal. But just for the sake of knowledge, they have this and you will find it on their website in front of the main entrance. Allah says, O you who believe, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. So Islam promotes justice and fairness, not only between Muslims, but also with the disbelievers, those who differ with us in our religion. Allah says in the Quran, I've been commanded to do justice between you. And when we oppose or have feelings of hatred towards the disbelievers, it is not because of the color of their eyes or their hair. It is not because they come from a different culture or because they're richer or poorer. I t none of this at all. We hate, and this is part of our religion, to love and hate. We hate the disbelievers, not because of their persons, but because of their beliefs, because they associate others with Allah, because they attribute the sun to Allah Azza wa Jal. And for our love to our Lord, we hate those who insult him. Like when I love my father, but I hate his enemy. I don't hate the enemy because this or that. I hate his enemy because he's an enemy of my father. Allah Azza wa Jal says, all praise is due to Allah who created the heavens and the earth and made darkness and the light. Then those who disbelieve equate others with their Lord. This is the reason. And though we hate the disbelievers, and this is something a lot of them may not figure out or understand, our hatred to them is because of their disbelief. Yet our religion orders us, compels us to be fair with them. And this is almost unhuman-like, but it is the excellent balance that we have to try our level best to walk a very thin line. Allah says in the Quran, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just that is nearer to righteousness. And this is exactly what the companions understood. May Allah be pleased with them. Abdullah ibn Rawaha goes to the Jews, ordered by the Prophet ﷺ to collect the zakat. And because of them being Jews, he collects al-kharaj. They're non-Muslims, so they do not pay zakat, but they pay for the rent of the land. And he has to estimate the amount of dates, grapes, other crops, and calculate it. So in order for them to make him reduce the amount, 
they collected some of the jewelry of the women and gave it to him as a gift, quote unquote. This is a bribe. So Abdullah ibn Rawaha said to them clearly, by Allah, you are the most hated people in my heart, O Jews. Nevertheless, even though I hate you, this would not prevent me from being fair with you. And this money you're giving to me is a bribe. I will not accept it. The Jews said, by Allah, this is how Allah created the heavens and the earth, meaning through justice. And this is why the more you go against your whims and desires and you excel over your own feelings, the more you are rewarded at the side of Allah. Seven, the Prophet said, are in the shade of Allah on the day of judgment when there is no shade but the shade of Allah. The first one is a fair ruler, a fair imam, a fair and just governor. He's number one. Because if the ruler is fair and just, the whole country, the whole nation, and his subjects and citizens would be living a perfect life. And this is why, unfortunately, we hear a lot of injustice in courts, in committees that are supposed to solve disputes between companies or between the workers and their employees or their employers. And this is why the Prophet told us والسلام, that judges are three types, two in hell and one in paradise. And this is not to divide them according to percentage or according to their numbers, but rather according to their categories. So the Prophet is telling us that there is this judge who knows the truth but rules otherwise. He's in hell. There is this judge who does not have knowledge yet sits and rules without knowledge. He's in hell. And there is this third judge who knows the truth and rules by it and he is in paradise. Allah Azza wa Jal made injustice haram for himself. So he said, O my servants, I have prohibited injustice upon myself and I have made it prohibited upon you. So do not be unfair and uh, unjust. And Allah Azza wa Jal told us to be fair in all our affairs. So Allah says in the Quran, and when you testify, be just, even if it concerns a near relative. Allah says as well, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. And many times people ask us to solve their dispute in the masjid, on the streets, you're buying something in the supermarket, and two are disputing. And they tell you, Akhi, judge the situation. Who's right and who's wrong? Allah says, and if you judge, judge between them with justice. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. So what we see in our communities as Muslims, and this is what we care most about, we see a great deal of injustice. We see people preferring their relatives at the workplace, giving them jobs, giving them, giving them promotions. We see purchasing managers consuming bribes like crazy just for their own self-benefit. Otherwise, they would deprive a good product from being introduced because they did not pay the bribe. And this is a sign of destruction. Whenever you find those who are purchasing or responsible for awarding contracts, whenever you find them corrupt, having mansions, having billions of dollars in their bank accounts, being rich, 
This is a sign of destruction of the whole nation. The Prophet said, والسلام, the reason those before you were destroyed was that when a person of honor stole, they would leave him. And if a poor person stole, they would implement the prescribed punishment upon them or upon him. And our Prophet himself والسلام, was the role model in being fair. So when the group of Jews used to come and greet him by saying, Assamu alaykum. Salam means peace. Sam means death. So they used to play with words and say, Assamu alaykum. And he used to say, Wa alaykum, and upon you. Would not say peace upon you. He said, upon you. Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, understood this. So she cursed them and swore against them and told them that you are the grandchildren of the apes and the pigs. May death be upon you. And the Prophet ﷺ, being fair and just, told his mostly beloved wife, Mah ya Aish, stop, O Aisha. Allah Azza wa does not like vulgar words and obscenity. You should not say what you are saying. And part of justice in Islam that there is no racism. So the Prophet, when he tells us that there is no preference for an Arab over a non-Arab or for a non-Arab over an Arab, and there is no preference for a red over a black or a black over a red, except through virtues of uh, uh, righteousness. So this is the thing that separates us, our level of righteousness. In Islam, we're ordered to be fair with the wife when dealing with her, when treating uh, uh, her, when giving her her rights in full. And this is manifested in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, your Lord has rights over you, your wife has rights over you, your health or body has rights over you, and your guest has rights of you, so give each its due right. The Prophet ﷺ, when Safiya, Mother Safiya, may Allah be pleased with her, sent some food to his house while he was with Aisha. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, got, got angry. She was outraged. How dare she send food on my day in my house? So she hit the servant's hand and the plate fell on the ground, smashed, and the food was scattered. The Prophet ﷺ, the one who's fair and just, he collected the food and took one of Aisha's own plates and gave it to the servant to return it to Safiya. And he said that this is in compensation for the thing that you had broken. Now, you have to be fair, even if you have more than one wife, because if you're not, you will come on the day of judgment with one side of you tilted. Everyone else would recognize that you were not fair with your two wives or more. Being fair in what? Being fair in the money you spend, expenditures, in housing, being fair in distributing your time and days, a day here, a day there, a week here, a week there. But there are things that you cannot be fair in. And that is your inclination through your heart. So you may love one more than the other, but you do not express it. You do not show it. And you're fair in everything else. You have to also be fair between your children. So especially when you give them gifts. The Prophet ﷺ was approached by Al-Bashir ibn Sa'd. And he's the father of an numan ibn Bashir. Bashir gave his son, an numan a plot. And another narration gave him a slave as a gift. His mother refused. He said, she said, first of all, make the Prophet Aisam approve of it. So when the 
he approached the Prophet ﷺ and told him that I gave my son a Nu'man, so and so. The Prophet asked him a specific question. Do you have other children? Bashir said, yes. The Prophet asked another specific question. Did you give them all similar to what you, you gave the Nu'man? Bashir said, no. Then the Prophet ﷺ gave us the verdict. He said, do not make me witness injustice. Make someone else testify. I do not testify over injustice and uh, uh, something that is unfair. And then he said, fear Allah and be equal between your offspring. And in another narration, the Prophet asked him a third specific question. Would you like them all, that is your children, to be good to you? And he said, yes, of course. The Prophet said, then be good to them in giving them equal gifts. And this goes for the father and also for the mother. They have to be equal in gifts. This is different than when you pay for something they need, which is known as nafaqa. So, a child that is three or four years old going to KG one or two gets an allowance different than the allowance that a child who goes to university and has a car and drives his siblings to school. So the money given is different. But when it comes to Eid, for example, and you want to give a gift, they have to be equal. When it comes to um, passing the school for uh, uh, succeeding in uh, um, going to the following year, you have to be equal in gifts. Also, to be fair with the children in showing your affection. The Prophet ﷺ was once in his place of sitting and there was another man next to him. So the man's boy comes. So the man picks up his boy, he kisses him and places him on his lap. And a while later, the man's girl come, his daughter, young daughter comes. So he places her in front of him. So the Prophet ﷺ said, wouldn't you treat them equally? This is unfair. This is injustice. Why do you kiss the boy and not kiss the girl? Why do you place the boy on, in your lap and not your girl? This is unfair. And this is why Ibrahim al nakhi used to say they used to love that a man is fair and treats his children equally even when kissing. And finally, it is part of our values, our religion that we are fair with even the non-Muslims. Islam is a religion of peace, of tolerance, even with our enemies. And I, don't, I do not know any religion that promotes peace and tolerance with the enemy other than Islam. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, in an authentic hadith, stating, this concept of fairness and justice that a lot of the Muslims may not be aware of due to their ignorance, due to their distance from the Quran and the Sunnah. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever does wrong to a mu'ahad, who is a mu'ahad? He is a kafir who has a peace treaty with the Muslims. So any non-Muslim who is at peace with Muslims either staying in their land or there's a treaty between our governments, he's a mu'ahad. So the Prophet says, وسلم, whoever does wrong to a mu'ahad or tries to put him down or burden him with more than he can bear or takes something from him without his consent, the Prophet says, وسلم, I'll be his opponent on the day of resurrection. Whoa. This is a serious warning. 
If the Prophet is your opponent, والسلام, you are at great loss. So we have to be fair with the non-Muslims. Ibn Taymiyyah says, may Allah have mercy on his soul, that as you testify for your ally, for your relative, for your brother, then it is part of fairness that you testify against him when the need calls. And as you testify against the non-Muslims or your enemies, you must testify for them and in their favor when the need comes. Because this is fairness and justice. Allah Azza wa Jal says, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just, that is nearer to righteousness. This value, which is part of our religion, it is part of the core of our religion, to be fair and just, this is something that Muslims must not take lightly. They must embrace it. They must implement it. And they must, they must show the whole world that what they, do, what they do, they do it for the sake of Allah and to be fair and just. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. After which Abu Bakr began to weep and say, And is my life and wealth for anything besides you, O Messenger of Allah? This narration shows the level of etiquette and humbleness that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. For he likened himself to a slave of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam by saying that his wealth was only for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well as his soul and self. This comes as no surprise for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has more right on the believers than themselves. He, may Allah be pleased with him, spent his wealth in the cause of Allah and he consoled the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam through his own self. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam recognized that for him and said in order to build his stature and to remind the ummah of his virtues no one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of abu bakr helped me among the benefits of this narration it is important to keep good manners and humbleness in the presence of the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam thanking someone who has bestowed some favor on you, as well as supplicating for them, is part of having good manners. Reported by Al-Bukhari, reported by Al-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, Al-Bani ruled it authentic in his book, Sahih Al-Jami'. The explanation of As-Sindi on the book of Ibn Majah and At-Taysir, Bisharh Al-Jami' As-Saghir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Sadia says, can we say ameen to the duas that we make for ourselves and also can we say ameen to the duas that we make for others? First of all, what is the meaning of ameen? Ameen is well known to be said after the Fatiha. 
So when we supplicate by re reading it, saying, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim, guide us to the straight path, then we say, Amin. And it means, O oh Lord, answer and respond to our supplication and to our request. And this is why scholars say that whenever someone makes dua, you say ameen as asking Allah to answer and accept. So someone says, may Allah forgive the Muslim ummah, may Allah grant them success in this life and the hereafter, and you say ameen. There's no problem in that. The problem is when you make dua for yourself, is it part of the sunnah to say ameen? Never we heard the Prophet ﷺ saying it after any of his dua. So for example, O turners of heart, make my heart steadfast on your religion. This is dua. Never we heard the Prophet say ﷺ, ameen. In all of his duas, which means that it is not part of the sunnah. Yet, the general concept is that Amin is said to ask Allah to respond and answer. Therefore, if someone says it and he does this after his own dua, I would not say it's haram, but it is not part of the sunnah. And definitely following the sunnah is the best. What about saying Amin to other people's dua? There's no problem in that. So even if the Imam is doing dua in Jum'ah, in Friday sermon, we say Amin. But we do not raise our voices to fill up the whole masjid. We just say something like Amin, so that I can hear it. And in Fridays, we do not raise our hands like a lot of the people do. Neither the Imam nor the followers. He makes dua, and if he wants, he may point with his index finger. So, Allahumma a'izz al Islam wa al Muslimin. Allahumma arhamna, Allahumma aghfir lana. No problem, but not like this. And the, the, the followers do not raise their hands as well, except in one simple condition that the Prophet used to do والسلام, in one simple situation and that is when the Imam is making dua for rain so when the Imam says Allahumma asqin al ghayth oh Allah grant us rain so the congregation raise their hands and say Ameen this is the sunnah other than that on a Friday uh, uh, prayer in the Friday sermon you do not raise your hands if someone is leading the prayer in witr, like we do in taraweeh, and the imam is Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, he raises his hands, the congregation raise their hands and they say, Ameen. So this is permissible and there's nothing wrong in that. Aisha says, are all the devils chained up in Ramadan? If yes, then why do people still commit sins and become more impatient while fasting? Well, it goes without saying that the devils are chained in Ramadan. And this is an authentic hadith. When Ramadan comes, the gates of paradise are open and the gates of hell are locked and closed and the jinn or the devils or the masters of the devils, Maradatul Jan, they are chained. And the hadith is correct. Now, how is this taking place? Scholars differed. Some say that this is literal and they are chained, but they went on to say, not all of them are chained. Those who are the, among the masters of the jinn, the leaders of the devils, these are chained. And the young ones, 
the uh, uh, normal Joe are on the loose. Others said that it is not actual chaining, but rather a figure of speech. And it is meant that they are not successfully permitted to do what they used to do other than Ramadan. So they cannot attain the same results as if they were chained. So their productivity in the other 11 months is like, their efficiency is like 90%. In Ramadan, it's like 25%. And the most authentic opinion is that they are chained. Whether they're the masters or all of them, we do not know, but we acknowledge the hadith and we believe in it as it is. Because Imam Ahmad, may Allah have mercy on his soul, was asked if the devils are chained, why do we see people with seizures and jinn possession? Imam Ahmad did not elaborate. He simply stated that we believe in the hadith and we do not go beyond it. And these are the type of logic that may drive a person out of religion. When you start to logic things in religion that are from the world of the unseen, we do not have knowledge of it. It is beyond our comprehension, our intellect, and our imagination. So why go and discuss such things? The other day, a person came to me and said, did shaitan whisper to Adam to eat from the forbidden tree? I said, yes, he did. Then he said, how did he do so if he was expelled from paradise? So Adam is in paradise and uh, Iblis, Satan, is outside of paradise. How did he influence Adam and his wife Eve to eat from the forbidden tree? I said, subhanAllah, how would I know? Was I there? This is something that Allah had told us about. He said, yeah, yeah, but this is not logical. SubhanAllah, have you seen Satan with your own eyes? What, what do you mean by not logical? Nowadays, we have telepathy, they claim. Nowadays, we have mobile phones. About 100 years ago or more, if you told someone that I can speak to your cousin in the USA, which requires a journey of a month and a half maybe, by sea and by land, etc., to reach, if you tell him that I can call him and communicate with him, he would say, you're crazy. Now, mobile phones do this with extreme ease. So how would I know how Satan communicated with Adam? This is not in my job description. I don't have to know this. What's in my job description is that I have to believe whatever Allah stated in the Quran or whatever the Prophet ﷺ told us. Anything extra would not be good for you or for your Iman. We have uh, Muhammad from uh, England. Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have one question. Yes, sir. If a lady, a woman, uh, have her period, monthly period, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, um, the monthly period has been finished. Okay. The normal. And after a couple of days, again, she uh, feel ill. So whether in this situation she can continue the fasting or not? After, after two days, she got her menses again? Yes. From the normal period finished already, she started again after a couple of days. 
bleeding the flow the flow of blood or only brownish discharge or spottings both okay i will answer you inshallah muhammad from ghana or mahmoud mahmoud from ghana assalamu alaikum shaykh assalamu alaikum shaykh i have a question to ask yes sir about yeah three questions yes sir yeah please uh, i have a a fiance and yeah. we are in the month of ramadan and my family have gone through every process for us to get married but we haven't officially married yet but all the families are where meet everything so we are preparing our marriage so in this ramadan can i talk to her or we are living in a different country can i talk to her on phone or can i support her financially okay. that's the first question the second question is uh, if you have a family, uh, can you pray with your family in home as a man, or will you go to going to Masjid is better, or can you play with your family, pray with your family home? Okay. That's the second question. The third question is, uh, can a woman pray Taraweeh prayer home, or is it better for her to go to Masjid and pray? That's okay. my last question. I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, Muhammad from the UK, he says that if a woman had her monthly period and then it stopped and after two days she got it again, what to do? First of all, this is not normal. Usually, the vast majority of women get their monthly cycle once a month. However, there is a lot of confusion in understanding what counts as purity and what counts as menses. For example, a woman may see her menses for five days and then it stops for a, an hour or two. She thinks that she's clean. She takes her ghusl and after a day or two, it comes back again. And we say that you hastened. You should not have been quick to perform your ghusl without waiting and making sure that your purity is there. Because a woman's purity is recognized by two signs. And these two signs come at the end of her monthly period. One is the white thread like discharge. So whenever she wipes herself, she sees a white thread like discharge without any yellowish or brownish or reddish colors. Or by seeing pure uh, uh, dryness. So whenever she cleans herself, she sees nothing on the tissue. No color discharge. And this has to be at the end of her period, not on the first, second, third day or so. So either she was haste and performed ghusl before its time, or she did see her purity and she was pure and she was legit to perform fasting and prayer and the other things that were prohibited during her menses. But what she saw two days later was spotting a drop or two of blood, colored discharge, brownish or yellowish. And these things do not affect her purity and are not considered to be part of her menses because she has already seen her purity. So she should disregard these, perform wudu after every adhan and clean herself, of course, and prays and fasts and her husband can be intimate with her without any problem. Now, one in a million that she finished her seven days of menses, she saw her purity, she performed ghusl. A couple of days later, she got the flow of the blood. And the flow of, a blo of the blood is considered to be menses. No doubt about it. So if this is the case, and it's very rare, then she should refrain from fasting and praying because this is her second period, providing that it does not exceed in total with her previous period, 15 days 
a month. So if she got seven days in the first one, two days pure, and then another eight days, the total is 15. So this is the max. On the eighth day, she performs ghusl, prays, and fasts, even if there is the flow of the blood, and she takes the ruling of al-mustahadah, the one with the continuous bleeding. Mamduh from Ghana says, can I speak to my fiancé? We're not married yet. The answer is no. Your fiancé is a stranger to you, Mamduh. She's not your wife. She's not your mahram. If you have a sister and someone proposes to her and you like the suitor and the proposal, you accept. You designate the wedding or the marriage contract to be written after a couple of months. In these couple of months, they're total strangers. They're not allowed to speak to one another because so many times such an engagement is broken. Maybe he sees another woman that has more in her than he wants in your sister, so he breaks the engagement and moves on to another woman. And by this, all what your sister was doing in the previous weeks or months was haram because she was communicating with an unmahram, with a total stranger. And so many people get engaged and break their engagement five, six times, but they had an affair, or at least they had communication with their supposedly future spouse, which did not work out. So Islam cuts all the means for haram and tells you, okay, you are allowed as a fiance, as someone who's proposing, to have the initial interview where you go meet the father, sit with him, and then he allows his daughter to come. You sit together in his presence. You speak for an hour. You look at each other, try to know one another's uh, personality and get attracted to. We have the green light, engagement is done, but not the marriage. Once the marriage takes place, then you can do whatever you want to do. Number two. Uh, Mamduh says, can a person pray with his family, wife, mother, parents, whatever, at home, or it's an obligation for him to go to the masjid? If the masjid is within the vicinity of your home, meaning within the radius of two to three kilometers, it is a must for you to attend the congregational prayer as a man in the masjid. If not, then you can lead your family. His third question was, or is, can a woman pray taraweeh at home? The, pr the question is a little bit awkward. It should be reversed. Can a woman pray taraweeh at the masjid? Because the default and the norm is that a woman prays taraweeh in her home. This is more rewarding, and this is the more, more following the sunnah, and this is what the Prophet ﷺ instructed her. Uh, Mamdouh's first question, communicating with his fiancé, I think he mentioned something about providing for her. Does he have to give money to her as she is his fiancé? The answer is no. There's no strings attached yet. You are not obliged to provide or to spend anything on her yet. Manjural says, how is listening to the Qur'an recitation directly from someone, uh, uh, same as listening from my iPad. There is, there is no maharij uh, maintained by the speaker since it has no mouth or tongue. This is a question that is a little bit confusing. When you listen to someone in front of you reciting the Quran and you listen to a recorder or to your iPad or to whatever from the internet, it's the same Quran. If you're blind, you will not be able to differentiate whether this is a human being live in front of you or a recording. So what you're saying, uh, Brother Manjrul, means that probably you have a confusion of something else. The recitation is the same. The makharij al-huruf, the way the letter comes out from your mouth is the same. Hamid says, is it authentic that if you do one voluntary fast for the sake of Allah, you will be 70 years away from hellfire? The answer is yes. Then he says, then 
Can we do the math by saying that if you do mandatory fast for the sake of Allah, the reward will be 70 times, which is 49,000 years away from that. This is wrong. You do not work things out like this. The hadith you're referring to that the fard is multiplied 70 times in Ramadan is not authentic. So the full concept is wrong. And it is dangerous for you to start to calculate how much Allah will reward you. Because if you calculate, then Allah will calculate against you how much you should have done to compensate for the reward and blessing of the sight, of your hearing, of your health, of your feet, of whatever Allah has given you. And this is pretty dangerous. Mehwish says, what are the things that a, mens a, a woman in her menses can do in Ramadan, especially during night? During night, everything that Muslims do, other than praying and fasting, a woman can do. Dhikr, reciting the Quran, making dua, connecting to her kinship, doing good deeds, feeding the poor, the sky is the limit. Fida says, is your salat invalidated if you speak something in uh, it involuntary? No. If you speak involuntarily, without wanting, without intention, forced to do this, Allah doesn't hold you accountable. I'm praying and all of a sudden the child is about to touch something that may kill him. And without even thinking, I said, whoa, watch out. And I, I, I'm not thinking. It just came out impulsively, not intending to do it. The prayer is valid, inshallah. Shabir says, people in India and Pakistan think that the night before the Eid, they call it Laylatul Jaiza, is uh, uh, something that Allah would answer your supplication and you answer your dua and you must, must not go shopping on that night and you have to spend it in dhikr and supplication. This is all baseless. This is all an innovation. We spend the nights throughout the whole year, 360 days, nights in prayer because this is a sunnah. But to specify the Eid with such rituals, this is an innovation. Uh, Mumina says, what is the reward of giving food to people to break their fast? The Prophet said, والسلام, whoever breaks the fast of a person fasting, he will have the same reward as the person who fasted. So when I give food to a person to break his fast, then I will get the same reward of him fasting. And Sheikha says, what is the ruling on Forex? Forex is prohibited when dealing with gold and silver because it has to be cash uh, uh, in exchange of gold simultaneously, physically, not online. Buying gold and, and silver online is totally prohibited and riba. And Abdul Hamid says, what is the ruling on praying in masjid where there is a grave? Your prayer is invalid and you must not pray in any masjid that has a grave in it, whether it was built on the grave or the grave was introduced to that masjid and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet same time tomorrow. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل إنني هداني ربي إلى صراط مستقيم دينا قيما ملة إبراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين